Hey now, it's Rob here, Rob School of Music. Welcome back to another awesome interview. We're talking about books again today, guys, and we're talking about a book about Eddie Van Halen, who is the reason why a lot of us picked up the guitar in the first place. There it is. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Get this backwards thing. No, nah, it was perfect. I saw it clearly. <laughs> so let us welcome. Let us welcome Brad and Chris, author of Eruption Conversations with Eddie Van Halen. How you guys doing? Awesome. Good, Rob. Thanks for having us on. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Let me tell you, it, it, if it's Eddie Van Halen, I will talk about it every second of my life. He is. <laughs> I love Us your shirt. Too. It's very thank cool. You. <laughs> thank you. Well, it's funny because because like super quick for me. So I my first Van Halen record was that that best of that had like the two new David Lee Roth songs. That was like my wow. first complete Van Halen record. And then shortly thereafter, I got Van Halen three. So like wow. I subscribed to Guitar World forever. And obviously I knew the earlier songs, but my first new Van Halen record was Van Halen 3. So like the, the Guitar World that had Eddie wearing this shirt, I was like, oh yeah. my God, what a rock star. This is everything. And then I went backwards. <laughs> I'm like, I had no idea. But cool. so, you know, I like to get to the beginning of everything and then we'll kind of catch up to it. So what are your guys' background, you know, with writing and stuff and music? Well, uh, I was uh, editor in chief of guitar world for many years a couple of decades as a matter of fact so uh chances are if you read guitar world some point in your life then you probably read some of my work and, and chris worked there as well and i've written a couple of other books too um the precursor to this was uh, light and shade conversations with jimmy page uh and i wrote another book on the history of the electric guitar called play it loud awesome Mm -hmm. My story is long and twisted and um, a little bit weird, but uh, no, actually it began uh, in Los Angeles. I was a student at UCLA and I was a freshman there and I saw an ad in the, the, the paper, the UCLA Bruin, uh, for an internship at a record label. And I showed up. It was Boardwalk Entertainment owned by Neil Bogart, the guy who had Casablanca previously and signed Kiss and Donna Summer and Village People and Angel and goes on and on. Um, I showed up for the interview guy asked me, you know, what do you do? You know, I looked at my resume and goes, oh, you're a writer. You're hired. You know, <laughs> and that was it. And I went off on this whirlwind rock and roll trip, um, did college radio promotion for them, got Joan Jett's I Love Rock and Roll, uh, saw that go to the top of the CMJ charts. They hired me. I did AOR singles promotion for them for a while until, the, until unfortunately, Neil died. Uh, from there, it was just this long and twisted journey. Went to work for Roland. Uh, did artist relations for them for a couple of years, started off actually writing brochures, like about probably 300 brochures because they put out so many products, uh, but ended up doing artist relations, got to meet Brad while I was working there. Cause I was also buying ads in the magazines and, um, just kind of thought, well, my next gig was guitar player magazine. And that was cool. You know, I, I grew up reading that magazine. Uh, but I was always had my eye on Guitar World. It's like they're getting the cool stuff. They're getting the access, you know, and it's like <laughs> I want a piece of that, you know. So uh, 95, I packed up my little tweed suitcase and my pork pie hat and headed to New York City. And uh, Brad hired me and um, it's been a long, crazy trip since then. That's awesome. I talk to my students here all the time because, you know, it, it, magazines aren't quite what they used to be and everything's online, which is even cooler because we can just see everything all, you know, I grab my iPad at night and I can read every guitar magazine as I go to bed, you know, not yeah. have a big stack on my nightstand. But growing up as a player, like I subscribe to Guitar World. Um, I have every issue from 96 till the end of 2005. I kept cool. every one of them. And like when those came in the mail, like it turned me on to so many new bands and new players. And I was just a sponge and taking it in. And I feel like sometimes now younger players, they'll fall into these Instagram holes and they get very like narrow. But like back then, like that's just what you had. So you had to read about, oh, there's a oh, blues. I don't know about blues. Cool. Awesome. But now there's Van Halen stuff and Marilyn Manson and so yeah. many different things. So, you know. Yeah. And, and, and I think the other thing that we did at Guitar World that, uh, you know, uh, people sort of don't appreciate maybe as, as much as that we really, um, perfected over there, the art of the transcription yes. and the transcriptions in the magazine. And I think even still to this day, uh, are much, much better than anything you're going to find on, uh, you know, online. 
Yes. And, uh, you know, gives you a deeper understanding and appreciation of the music as well. Completely. Yeah. Completely. I have a spreadsheet of all of the transcriptions in the magazines. And sometimes with the student, I'll pull out literally, you know, like a vintage Guitar World magazine to show them like, this is how I used to learn. They're like, no, just go to Ultimate Guitar. I'm like, no, it's garbage. Yeah, it's, it is. It's garbage. It, much of it is. I mean, the guys that uh, uh, did and, and do the transcriptions for Guitar World are genius are, are, are like the most brilliant guys at doing that in the U S I can guarantee you because we, we searched high and low for those guys and, you know, they just hear things and they captured the nuances that, that you just can't find up online. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So let's talk about this book guys. Now I'm, I'm an avid reader. I, I literally for up until maybe the last five years exclusively read biographies and music related books. My girlfriend is always breaking my balls saying, you know, <laughs> you, you need to develop and grow. I'm like, why? I like what I like. Yeah. And uh, you guys did an incredible job of weaving together this narrative through interviews and then interviews with other people. Like I'm like, I was interview with Gary Sharon in here. I didn't see that coming. Like it's just so well done to tell a cohesive story as though, it, it, it seems as though the intention from the very beginning was this is what this was going to be, as opposed to kind of pulling from different interviews and stuff. And that's, I imagine, very difficult to do. And I commend the hell out of you because it was a slam dunk home run. Well, well I think both of it was because Chris and I had spent so much time with Ed and we had so much material and we had gotten story right from him. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, it isn't just a collection of interviews with Ed. I mean, we uh, we do a lot of writing, putting things into context, sort of fact checking at a little bit because he could be a little fast and loose <laughs> with the truth <laughs> when he wanted to be. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, here's a here's the, the the truth of this matter is that he was arguably the most innovative guitarist since Jimi Hendrix, and therefore one of the great musicians of the 20th century. And we wanted to present this complete portrait of him, not just as a, uh, you know, as a personality or, you know, but as a innovative, brilliant musician and also, uh, you know, talk about his life and how it, how it shaped his, you know, the whole art form. What was, uh, individually, what was the first time you got to interact with him? What year and what was the story? Well, for me, that was, uh, it was in 1994, uh, November, 1994, uh, interview on the balance album. I was still working for guitar player magazine at the time. And, uh, that was a very cool experience because I mean, you want to go, I go back all the way to the beginning. Um, not, not the very beginning, but at least, you know, just before the first Van Halen album came out, I listened to, uh, KMET in Los Angeles and I heard you really got me when they rush released that um, before the album came out. And I just jumped at the opportunity to interview Ed because that was like one of my, my life goals. That was on my top of my bucket list. Um, so that was great. I mean, that was just, um, it was interesting because Ed had drastically changed his look at the time. You know, he mm -hmm. had this goatee, he had his hair cut short and cropped and this kind of, you know, spiky on the top and everything. And we'd seen him with short hair before, but never like that. And um, I remember I was standing outside 5150 and there's Sammy over there talking on the phone. And then he's talking with somebody and bitching about somebody with a with a three letter or three word name, like like, like David Lee Roth, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, let it go, Sammy, let it go. You know, you're in the band now. Yeah. Ten years. You've been there. <laughs> um, but anyways, and Jerry Cantrell's hanging around. And I'm, a, you know, a little starstruck, but not entirely because I've dealt with celebrities before. But still, it's like it was 5150. And this guy walks by me, he's like, sunglasses on, you know, the beard, the hair. Hi. I'm like, oh, hi. You know, I'm like, who was that? And then it took him about a minute and I'm sitting going like, that was Ed. Wow, that was Ed, you know. <laughs> and then the interview was just incredible. He had me in the studio. Um, even though I heard the album in its entirety, uh, I didn't get a copy back then. They just, they took me into the Warner Brothers uh, offices and I, I heard it play through once and that was it but ed was like oh no no you gotta hear it like this man you know and boom, on the speakers blasting you know and everything and he's telling me all about it and he was just the coolest guy you know he was just like one of uh, he was a guitar player you know and the fact that i was a guitar player 
you know, I, he just bonded. And I think that was the great thing about it. And I think that's the advantage that Brad and I had is that we're musicians, you know, and we spoke his language. We understood when he talked about six CA seven tubes, our eyes didn't glaze over, you know, when he was talking about string gauges or, you know, fret material, you know, we got it. And he cared about that stuff. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> a whole lot. <laughs> a whole lot. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I um, uh, met, you know, I, I knew Ed a bit earlier than than Chris. Uh, and, you know, Ed just ended up creating this really great relationship with Guitar World. So he knew we could trust us. Uh, he knew we understood where he was coming from um, and that we would probably print the truth <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that we understood. So, so it just became, it, we just, it just became a, a, an easy exchange over the years. Uh, you know, when a new record would come out or when he would be going on tour or something. You know, I talked with Ed probably a couple of times a year for, for, for many, many years, you know, uh, in depth and, and Chris and I would both be invited over to 5150. And, um, it was, it was cool as uh, Chris is also fond of saying is that, um, you know, Ed viewed everything through this guitar matrix, right? I mean, believe me, maybe he partied for an hour, but the, the rest of the 14 hours he was awake, it was all about the guitar. I mean, oh, yeah. he was, yeah. he was, a, he was an, uh, you know, obsessed. So um, that's the way he, he felt comfortable. That's where, that was the place where he loved to talk about what he was doing. And then through that uh, conversation about the instrument, we were able to get to all sorts of other, uh, you know, feelings that he had, uh, personal feelings that he had about the band or his career or records or, or whatever. So, um, you know, I don't want everybody to think that this book is just completely about the gear. You know, it's a fulsome portrait from the guy. Uh, and I believe that uh, he was probably as honest with us as he, he would, would be with anybody. Well, that was something that I found to be so interesting is, is it really came across and the interview sections that you guys are friends. Like he was just mm -hmm. so honest and like, you know, it's like, Oh, well, uh, you know, Sammy, uh, Sammy's okay. His lyrics are blah, blah, blah. But uh, Mike, he's not pulling his weight. I'm like, well, like he's, he's just laying them out to dry, you know? And I love that honesty because that was, you got a snapshot of how he felt in that moment. That's raw and real. And that's not something you see in, in published at all usually. Cause that could, cause a whole shit storm and, and you didn't, it's just, boom, here's how it is what he said. You know, he, uh, like on, on a couple of occasions, just, just how strong that he felt about what he was doing was, I mean, he would shed real tears when he was upset about something about mm -hmm. his music or his, you know, the band relationship and what was happening with him. So that's sort of the relationship we had. That's the comfort level he had. Um, and it was important for us, uh, after he passed uh, away to honor him with a book that presented, uh, him as a, uh, as a flawed individual, but a, uh, you know, one of the great geniuses of, of contemporary music. Uh, you guys did a tremendous job. Like even, even as I was reading through it, because when I, you know, when you first started talking, I thought it'd have been all interviews but if you if it had no interviews just the story that you're telling in the non-interview sections it's an incredible story like that in itself stands by itself and then I all of a sudden that. just mm -hmm. oh yeah definitely and then all of a sudden it's like here's the man himself talking yeah. in this raw and real way about a gamut of topics like i love that there was gear stuff i love the eddie's oddities and little you know nerded cool. out i'm like i didn't even know he had half those guitars yeah and then the interlude sections you got luca there you got vi you got mike anthony gary sharon like all these different perspectives of people who are in the room. And I think a lot of the focus usually is it's like, well, what does Sammy Hagar think of it? What did David Lee Raw think of it? But like, these are like the dudes who are in the trenches who have been experienced by it or interacted with it. Speaking super candidly, I just, I didn't expect that. And that was really, really, really cool as a fan. And just as a fan of music in general, like I feel like this book would be, everyone knows Eddie Van Halen is everyone knows, you know, jump or they know Panama or they know Van Halen tune. But if you're just a fan of music and, and, pop culture and just like such a 
I can't even find the word because there isn't the right word. Someone who was so important to music as a whole. Well, that's like, that's is, important here. That's that's you know is, is really how broad reaching Eddie's influence was, and I think it gets overlooked. You know, a lot of yeah. people look at him like, oh, he's this guy who was married to Valerie Bertinelli, and he made these fun videos on MTV and had some hits. Yep. You know, and Ed Ed's contributions were really far reaching. You know, how the guitar is played, how the guitar is made. You know, amplifiers, pedals, strings. You know, um, the Super Strat that came from Ed. That's right. the most popular guitar design of the modern day is, is what Ed did. Um, and it affected the way other people played. Which exactly. That reached. It was kind it of, you know, the whole shred phenomenon people. that happened in the eighties would not have happened if it hadn't been for Ed and, and for Ed making that style of guitar playing popular. Um, but in talking about Sammy and Dave, why we didn't include them, we didn't even reach out to them because they've written their books. They've mm -hmm. had their say about Ed. Uh, we wanted to get the other people who knew ed very well but often get overlooked a chance to expand upon how they knew him and you know and just and fill in some of those blanks some of those things that we couldn't get from from ed uh you know while he was still around sure. um so that was important but yeah the, the overreaching thing with this book was really ed the genius you know ed the composer ed the musician player uh, Ed, the guitar innovator, the equipment innovator, you know, he had his own brand. That's just phenomenal. I mean, that's, that's unheard of. And sure. but he's fully deserving of that. And interacting with him in the studio, was he ever like, check out this thing or check out this riff? Cause it's like, when was it a couple months ago? Like a video came out of him playing, uh, Amsterdam, but like six years before balance, like, mm -hmm. would, you know, do you recall any moment where there's maybe a snippet of something that like turned into something else? Cause I'm sure there's, there's must be millions of tapes of stuff. Thousands. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did hear, um, you know, Ed would play in the studio when we were there, you know, he would just pick up his guitar and, and he would be playing more out of cabot or impulse, I think <laughs> than anything. And uh, I did hear some unreleased material, uh, but I can't say that that I heard, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, pound cake before it came out, or or whatever, or whatever, you know, wasn't it wasn't quite like that. But uh, we we uh, it was you know pretty awesome. I mean, it was pretty thrilling when you would go to fifty one fifty. And you would see all of these historic guitars and the Frankenstein would be there and the 5150 guitar and his Marshall amp, the classic Marshall that he used on all the records is almost enshrined in its own room with its own microphones, you know, all that business. And, uh, you know, Chris and I have talked about this quite a bit. The really interesting thing about watching Ed play, like, you know, two feet away from you or a foot away from you is the sort of, um, it, he never played it casually, you know, like how we pick up the guitar and we'll like noodle around on some riffs or something like that. Ed was always played with a certain sort of intensity and it's something that you hear uh, or that you feel when you listen to the records like when he when he was tapping or he'd play it was like mm, you know yeah uh you know he was uh he was digging in on both sides you know whether it was this pick or his fingers or 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 the fretboard work and uh the electric guitar you know the frankenstein that he would play or the you know music man guitar or whatever it was that he happened to be playing it almost took on the resonance of an acoustic guitar because wow. he he just laid into it you know yeah. you could it hear was, it was sound. powerful i mean it was just he, he just you know it was intense you know it's no wonder he went with stainless steel frets later on because you know he wore frets down yeah you know he just he played hard he had a very aggressive stance and it was just like to pull every single vibration he could out of that instrument and people often talk about like oh ed on the first album he had to be using an overdrive pedal it's like nope eddie van halen was the overdrive pedal <laughs> you know <laughs> It's like, I can't get that sound out of a Marshall Plexi. Well, because you don't play the guitar as hard as Ed. That's why, you know, it's like that that amp is screaming for mercy, you know? Sure. I liked how also that you guys, like, there's so much that's been discussed about the, the, 
Dave era and so much about the Sammy era. But then it's like, as I said earlier, like Van Halen three was what was happening when I first started playing music. So like, to me, that's what I, like I that was my first time seeing him live. And then I've luckily been able to see him with the other reunion tours, but it was, it was Gary Sharon. And I was like this, and he was so excited about that at the time. Yeah. Like this is the second, the third coming. Like I found my guy yeah. and you know, to hear Gary have something to say about it in your book and just kind of catch snippets of that era of that, emotional roller coaster of all of it. I thought that was fascinating because I feel like from then onward, it's like that was almost erased. And it's like, no, now Dave's back and everything's fine. Or Sammy was back and everything's fine. It's like everything's been sort of glamorized in the last chapter of everything in Van Halen. But I think we've forgotten that there was supposed to be something very different. So I thought that was really cool that you had stuff about that. Yeah, that was a super important section of the book for us. Uh, because Van Halen three was particularly meaningful to Ed. Right. It was uh, going to be, I think the launching point for a whole new, almost a whole new approach to the guitar or to recording um, something more intricate that we hadn't heard before. And um, the fact that it wasn't, as accepted as uh, as some of the earlier records really did a lot of um, damage to Ed's psyche. Mm. Uh, he had been so used to being successful and, you know, all the records up until then had, you know, gone platinum two, three, 10 times. And uh, Van Halen three, he really invested a lot of personal capital into that record. And the fact that people, it wasn't embraced as much as the other records, really uh, sent him into a bit of a downward spiral, which we talk about in the book. There were other things also going on where, you know, he was still battling with substance abuse and, uh, you know, health issues. Um, and he was breaking up with uh, Valerie Bertinelli. And each one of those things would have thrown a, a you know, driven a, a normal man to to the bottle or whatever but all of these things hitting at time created a, a a real darkness but in all of that what's really been overlooked and it, it's so cool to hear you talk about it was how much great stuff was actually on van halen three yeah you know and if he had given a mo if he had been given sort of a little bit more leeway by the fans to develop some of those ideas i think we would have gotten a lot more music out of Ed and, mm -hmm. and, and maybe even, you know, a whole huge third act that, that yeah. we'll never hear. It's such a bummer because you think about it, like that was what came after that, you know, like the, the Roth nothing. album, which was, <laughs> <laughs> exactly nothing. <laughs> and like once a year to the day, like those are cool songs. Oh, so yeah. it, I, I, the ballads, incredible slide guitar playing on. Yeah, that. I mean it's it's some it's some of the it it wasn't produced as well as it could have been, and we make that point in the book. Mm -hmm. um, Ed probably could have uh, benefited from a stronger sounding board, but that wasn't where his head was at. He wanted to do what he wanted to do at that at that period. Uh, he just wasn't prepared for the consequences, um, yeah. unfortunately. It was fascinating, though, because Ed would bring it up from time to time, especially those Eddie's oddities. That was um, kind of from a guitar aficionado cover story I did with Ed, where he just took me through his collection. You know, he pulled out 50 guitars there at 5150. And, you know, we had a photographer, Kevin Scanlon, great guy, did the back cover of the book. Um, you know, we went through all the stuff. He you know, asked me what I wanted to see. And, um, you know, it was just great because each guitar had a story. Mm -hmm. And he pulled out this Gretsch 6120, which is, you can read in the book about that, but he was just talking about that in context of all these overdubs and these guitar textures he was exploring. You know, it wasn't just, um, you know, the super strat, the Frankenstein plugged into the Marshall or the 5150 amp, you know, he was really exploring a lot and he was really bummed, you know, that just people didn't accept it because he just, you know, it was, everything else has kind of been there, done that. And he really wanted to expand and push and go forward. And people said, like, we're not ready for that yet. And that really knocked him for a loop. And I urge anybody who is skeptical about uh, Van Halen 3, just go back and listen to the rhythm playing. 
Yeah. The 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 the, the syncopations on that record are, are are unbelievable. It's like a whole next level in terms of his in terms of his rhythm. Yeah. I often find myself falling down these rabbit holes, seeking out, you know, these white whale versions of songs and things like, you know, uh, the two new David Lee Roth songs on the greatest hits that one of them was like a leftover balance thing, like backdoor shuffle or something. But then like the stuff that would have come next with Gary Sharon, like they had some stuff written. I'd love to hear demos of that. Cause I think it had been crazy good. Yeah. Brad's heard it. <laughs> oh, you've heard it. Tell me, tell yeah. me. Is it awesome? <laughs> No, the, the sort of the interesting thing is, is and, and and Gary mentions this in the book, was that um, he Gary felt like the it, things would have been much different if the record that they were sort of working on or making after uh, three would have came first, because in some ways Ed uh, was was retreating just a bit to maybe an original style after the uh after three got rejected that he went back to doing something a little bit more that you would have heard on different kind of truth you know and and those are the things that i heard was a, a bit more raw a little less overdubbed uh uh gary sent me one thing where I, I just love this. He said, you want to hear something of just the band going wild, like just Alex and Eddie going to town, you know, just jamming. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, <laughs> like it's it sort of like, it was sort of like the, dr the dream or the wish that we would have on all the Van Halen records that there would just be one song where it would just be Ed going nuts with Alex for six minutes or something. Yeah. You know? And, uh, and he sent me, and it was attached to a song, but the whole after jam was like this total freak out, you know, with with Ed and Alex. Uh, so, you know, it's funny. I, I wish that Ed, to some degree, would have had the guts to pursue some of the some of the vision that he started on three, but I think already he he retreated a little bit. And and Gary's point was if if the second record had come first, people might've been able to accept a little bit more right. and exactly. then had the growth uh, follow that, you know? So, but uh, you know, having to, what other band has ever survived three different lead singers? You know, it's, it, it wasn't an easy, it was a uphill battle, no matter which way uh, it would have taken. Yeah, totally. But, you know, again, it, I just think it's incredible that, something is coming out which is coming out on october 5th and i'm gonna the link is on this and when you're listening to it click down below please pre-buy it because it's awesome and i can't wait to get my physical one so i can put it up <laughs> on the shelf behind me here um but just to have something to be able to like whoa here's like a chapter in this band's career that's largely forgotten or not discussed and here's the players in the game talking about it like no wait there's more you know yeah it's, it's very fascinating mm -hmm. It was important to us, too, in this book to not overlook um, Ed's musical instrument contributions. So we have a chapter devoted to that. Um, you know, EVH, again, you know, this progression going from Kramer to developing his own signature model with Ernie Ball, Music Man, uh, through the association with PV, uh, and then EVH, you know, right. to go to that. And, and then we also have a nice piece kind of linking him in with the Southern California guitar madman innovator type of mentality that ed completely fit into you know he was the new generation of that and um that that's the thing again just to repeat he wasn't just this rock star who was married to valerie bertinelli you know he was this complete guy a complete musician um in, in you know in so many ways and really just an important figure who needs to be remembered that way absolutely chris chris at, at one point got his hands on a on a document from uh Fender, um, where just to show you how important all this stuff was to Ed, there's it's like 200 pages. It's like actually more than that. It's the uh, it's Chip Ellis's diary from the Wolfgang Guitar Project, which took two years to come together. Wow. And he just he took notes every day of like Ed Ed wanted this done. We did this. You know, we tried out these different types of body wood. Nine months of this document are pickups. You know, wow. nine months of just trying out pickups. Um, this was just not, you know, 
hey, hey, Ed, do you like this guitar? He's like, oh, yeah, sure, man. Yeah, just here, put my name on it. You know, I mean, that's most artists, they kind of they put a little bit into it and it's put out and it's done. But Ed was just like, man, he was obsessing over every single detail, every curve of that thing, the strings, you know, I'm not the strings, I mean, the, the screws that were used. I mean, he was just like everything, you know, had custom pots made for that, you know, a, a no friction or low friction volume knob so he could do cathedral. Um, it yeah. just goes on and on with just the attention to detail on that. And it's just, it's remarkable, you know, a genius, genius stuff. That's the word genius. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. I think that, you know, touching on, oh, let me get this thought right. Cause I had this one written down and I didn't see it in my notes. I'm going to try okay. and do someone we're going to pull an audible here. If it doesn't make sense, we'll do it over. I think that having the ability to tell someone's life story at the same time by touching on what they did with their band and then also reference what they did culturally for the musical instrument itself, you know, putting them up there with Les and Leo as like someone who really made a difference. Mm -hmm. But then this overarching thing where put those all together. This was a pretty special individual, like culturally, globally for humans and music and, and what we do, you know, music is such a big part of life. And sure, man, like I talk to kids that are like, I talked to how Eddie held the pick, you know, mm -hmm. like I'm teaching, you know, how are you supposed to, how are you supposed to hold a guitar pick? Well, look, like, look how he held the guitar pick. That's not the traditional way to hold the pick with his hand all arched up and such. Mm -hmm. Was anyone going to tell him that's wrong? No way. And why yeah. would they? Cause it just, it worked in the most awesome way possible. Well, it, it's sort of funny. Um, I've, I've given this a lot of thought actually over the years about, uh, you know, I know rock and roll is supposed to be dangerous and it's supposed to be fun and it's supposed to be all these cool things, uh, you know, sort of, you know, culturally. And I felt I feel like in some ways that's prevented it from anybody really seriously considering what some of these guys did. I mean, even if you take somebody like Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin, um, you know, who I wrote about and, and, and talked with, you know, people would talk about the groupies and the exploits and, and the drugs and the, this and that, but here's a guy that altered the course of the way we listen to music in our everyday life. And if you care about music and you think music is important, you want to know that story too. It's a fascinating story. It's not a boring story. You know, it's, it's just as exciting as, as people's personal exploits and it affects you in your everyday life. When you're listening to some commercial and you hear a distorted guitar or whammy bar dive on your, you know, these are guys that have permeated every corner of our lives and of the culture. And, you know, um, at one point, I remember even talking to, to to Paige about this and saying, you know, Jimmy, you've had as much impact and as are as important to the music as as Charlie Parker, or Louis Armstrong, or you know, John Coltrane, or or even Stravinsky in terms of like popular culture and the way people, you know, and I don't think that that gets acknowledged. Same thing with Ed Van Halen. Uh, it's probably time that we really look at this stuff seriously and how it's, it, how it has impacted us. Absolutely. That was perfectly said. <laughs> I, I have conversations with, um, parents here at, at my school often where they'll, um, glamorize and, and put on a pedestal certain activities for their children. And this is something I say freely to them. So I'm not saying some secret that, you know, this is a strong opinion I have they'll minimize um, music and they'll be like, well, they, you know, they're going to quit soon because they're going to, you know, lacrosse season. <laughs> um, they will put the guitar down. I'm like, but why mm -hmm. music is such it's, it's inside of us and it is generational. And, and it's like, when you have a holiday, what draws people together? It's either the music or the food and, and players like this changed that in such an incredible way. So I'm just so thankful that you guys put something together like this. That just does such a, a great job. Of telling that story. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, you have students obviously that, that come to your, your store and it's important for them to see, you know, I think also, uh, 
to understand what you know what it takes to be a great musician mm -hmm. and it's so many things you know it's of course learning the notes but it's life experience and it's uh and it's the way you look at your instrument and you know the way you develop your sound and so you know for me i think there is some hope with this book that people read it and the musicians out there also walk away with something to bring to their own creativity i i think that will most definitely occur i think that's the, the most important thing lesson i've learned from ed is listen to yourself you know um ed started off and you know he was into clapton and a few other things and he realized early on i don't sound like these guys when i play so let me just go with that you know and he really went with that you know he went beyond with that you know he heard his sound in a certain way and he chased that throughout his entire life and i think that's a very important lesson to learn because it's very easy now to like learn note for note how to play this solo and um, i'm partially guilty because in guitar world i write this column where i tell people how to get you know how the rig that was used to make a certain classic record which you know, I love and all the settings sure. and everything yeah and you know it's like well that's really cool if you want to sound like somebody else but find your own thing find your own path and that's what ed did that's what set him apart from the pack you know is that he just really focused on that inner voice yeah i i that is like seeing that mindset has played such a huge part in my personal story like i will give a sorry my sorry <laughs> my yes I thought that was mine. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'm still not sure I'm going. Let's get rid of him. He's trying to tell me that his mom had a child, and he's trying to tell me the gender. I imagine. Ah, so, cool. Harsh. <laughs> um, super professional guys. <laughs> cool. Okay, man. Thought. That's life. That's <laughs> life. Exactly. Um, I'll give students uh, a piece to learn and they'll come back to play it note for note. And I say, that's not right. They say, why? I said, I wrote that. You're not me. Play it your way. Yeah. I'm like, whoa. Cool. I'm like, exactly. There, there's, oh. uh, there's a, that exact uh, lesson is actually in the book. Uh, when Ed was a, you know, young kid before he started playing guitar, he was playing piano and he would learn these classical pieces that his teacher would teach him. And he would talk about how he would even just play those his own way. And he ended up winning, um, you know, uh, these contests with like a thousand kids. And, and the way he stuck out was by perform by putting his own expression into these pieces, not just playing them uh, like he was playing a typewriter. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's the way to do it. Yeah. So I'm going to do my, my closing part here. And again, I'm going to link up the book and then I'm going to, I want everyone to get a copy. I may get two copies, one to give to some cool. students that I think uh -huh. will enjoy because I think people will get tremendous value, but this is my ending of my show. Little rapid fire guitar player nerd out. You guys want to uh -huh. play my game? Yeah. Okay. So it's a series of this or that questions. Uh, uh, just call them out. You can explain your answer or just say it. It's more fun if you explain it, but there are no wrong answers except for one question. I think there's a right and a wrong, but hopefully we won't have to go that way. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right. Humbucker or single coil pickup? Humbucker. Because you can turn a humbucker into a single coil pickup through wiring, uh, which I know very well. I just built a guitar based on Elliot Easton's lead one and a half custom that he used on the Panorama album. And um, also the, um, uh, what was it? The, um, uh, shake it up album and it's it's the coolest thing ever because you can get the front coil on the humbucker the back coil on it you can get both together you can have them in series like a traditional humbucker you can have them like two single coils run into each other and then there's a neck coil so you can get all these crazy combinations so humbucker all the way all right brad <laughs> Uh, well, Chris is probably given the right answer, uh, <laughs> but I'm going to give the, I'm going to give sort of a wishy-washy answer, which is, um, it's so funny, like for many years, I sort of avoided playing Strat style and Fender instruments because, you know, it just felt like so hard to move away from, you know, that Hendrixy Stevie Ray Vaughan mm -hmm. thing. So I just was playing humbuckers and, and, and Gibsons because I felt like it forced you to uh, find your own sound more. There was something about a humbucker that's a little bit more like 
uh, sort of an open book where you could, you know, where it forced you almost to create your, your own sound. But you know what? I just got a strat. And I'm really enjoying the <laughs> shit out of it. <laughs> I will you know, and, and I even find myself thinking, you know, if you would have just had this strat, you maybe you wouldn't wouldn't have ever used any other guitar. I, I'm I'm really loving it. So yeah. I don't know, you know, the different different times of life. And yeah, I, I, I will add that my personal favorite pickup is a P90. So that yeah. to me is just, it hits the happy medium, you know, between that fat humbucker sound and that bite that you get from a single coil. It's funny with the P90 because my first like nice guitar, my dad bought me a Les Paul, uh, but it was like the Studio Gem series. Right. And like the, so they all, they're beautiful. It was green. It's my favorite color, but it had P90s. And the guy at the store was like, this will be great for playing Metallica. And it was not. No. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I just ordered one of those Novo guitars with the, uh, and I could put the P90s in it. I'm so excited to come oh, back cool. to it because just the, the fullness and the coolness. So, yeah. A lot of great well, stuff recorded with P90s from Leslie yeah. West through Walk This Way, you know. Yep. Yep. No, there's no wrong answer to that question. They're all, they're all, all the correct answer. All cool. right. <laughs> Next one. Here we go. Do you like a uh, tremolo or like a hard tail, stop tail piece kind of thing? Okay. I'll answer it again. I'll go first. Okay. Um, I'm actually, a hardtail guy. I have lots of whammy bars and I love them and I use them, but I find more often than not, than not, I just like that direct transfer of a bridge that's just nailed in place. Sure. You know, that's just there. And um, so, yeah, I just ha I have to go with a hardtail. Uh, I guess sometimes it depends on the guitar though, too, but um, I find myself more often than not that I'm just sticking to the hardtail. Okay. Well, Probably the greatest sounding guitar I've ever played in my life was a uh, was like a 1972 SG that that I had a long time ago. It just it was just incredible. Like it 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 had the you know it didn't have the tremolo on it. You know it was just and then I've been playing a, a really great Les Paul like for the last you know ten years. But I just got the Stratocaster, yeah, and I'm really. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Fender. I'm really enjoying hey. it. I'm really, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, they're both awesome. I mean, the, the correct answer to almost every one of these questions would be like both, you know, just, just have multiple choices because we get yeah. that guitar itis where you, know, you look around this. Uh, this, this is why I have 150 guitars, is I love them all. Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> you know, it's different colors of the ever growing rainbow. Absolutely. 22 frets or 24 frets, if you had to choose just right now. 24. Okay. Just the extra notes. I mean, you know, the, the only real difference is that the, the neck pickup may be placed a little bit closer to the middle. Right. But you can compensate for that, you know, either in your, your attack or whatever. But yeah, just having those extra notes and it just, it makes sense. It just makes sense to have that, you know, those octaves and everything. So yeah, 24 frets by far. Okay. Yeah, I mean, more is better, you know. 20, <laughs> 26, <laughs> let's get it to 26. <laughs> but that strat has 22, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it All gets right. a little tight up there, you know. But. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's, I'm jumping around here. Yeah. Strings, nines or tens? tens? I like nines. Okay. I like nines. Um, again, you know, one of the words of wisdom I got from Billy Gibbons, who said he uses eights, and he says, it's in the fingers, man. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's in your attitude. What did you Eddie know? use? Did he use Eddie? Well, Eddie used nines, actually. That was like his main thing. I can't remember if in the end he was using tens, but pretty much throughout his career, he was using nines. I just like, you know, I'm getting older, you know, it's just, it's a little bit more comfortable, a little more slinky, but I also find it just really works for more styles of music. I mean, I started out playing tens you know, for the longest time and I was always like the heavier of the string, the heavier the sound. But over the years I've learned it, doesn't make too much of a difference. You can compensate in your gear. You can compensate in the way you play. Yeah, I just I just like tens. I like a little fight. <clears throat> I don't like my uh, action to be too low, and I don't like my strings to be too light. I I, I like the battle. You're going to war. I like it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, last couple of guys. These are just uh, effects based questions. So this yeah. is truly a this or that. They are unfair. So I apologize, but you must pick one. Oh no. Delay. I have 500 pedals, so don't I, ask me I, to pick one. 
<laughs> I have I have a, a cabinet in the front of the school here with all of my pedals, with the exception of like the super expensive ones. I let the students take them out like library wow. books so oh, they can cool. just kind of experience different things. Like what's the difference between a boss phaser and a phase 90? Let's find out. Yeah, cool. Delay or reverb? Delay because delay actually you can get reverb style effects out of it. This is a recording engineer trick. Uh, it's better to use delay than reverb because you can get that ambience, but it doesn't muddy up the sound as much as a reverb effect does. Well said. Yes, absolutely. Um, and especially if you're playing live, sometimes if you're, it's it's really it, you you can muddy up the sound really quick with uh, with the reverb. Agreed. Let me say, uh, well, phrase it as WWED. What would Eddie do? <laughs> Eddie used delay for reverb. So there you go. Yes, yes. These are tying back there if you're starting to catch my uh, my trend here. Cool. All right. Uh, okay, this one is, is a weird one, but if you had to pick, if you're going to take like a fuzz pedal or an overdrive pedal, which one would you choose? So like a fuzz face or like a tube screamer? Tube screamer. I love fuzz. It's cool. It's got flavor and everything, but for a bread and butter type of effect, overdrive all day long. Okay. Yeah, you know, a, a fuzz pedal can wear out welcome pretty quickly, yeah. as opposed to, you know, just a little bit of uh, of distortion, which is, you know, part of that sound. I mean, I, I, like I like I said, I love a good sound and, and I spent a, I spent some some serious time trying to find a great fuzz pedal that wouldn't disappear when yeah. I would play with other instruments, you know, but uh, uh, yeah, a little uh, it, you know, tube screamer, or in my case, uh, the TC electronics mojo mojo. Oh, uh, yeah, Paul Gilbert's. Uh, yeah. he turned me on to that one. And Ver Ver know. Vernon Reed, too. Yes, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, all right. Last one phaser, chorus, or flanger. All effects That's that Eddie a would very use. difficult one because I love them all. Yes, um. Let's see. I would go, and this is probably going to be cheating a little bit, uh, because I'm going to go with a flanger because Bold. if you set it up Bold. right, Bold. and if you have the right <laughs> flanger, you can get chorus effects like Andy Summers. Andy Summers used an electric mistis flanger to get all those chorus sounds on the police records. Um, Alex Lifeson, another guy who did that. Uh, and it's like phasing, but maybe a little bit more dramatic. Having said that, I'm on an early Isley kick right now, and that lady and that that phase shifter just hits me right here, man. It's yeah. just the coolest thing. Uh, and this guy in France makes a copy of that old Maestro, which he, um, John Paul Jones used on a lot of the Led Zeppelin stuff. Um, but it just this guy uh, in France is called Heptoed. Uh, what is it? The Heptoed. Uh, I can't remember virtuoso, heptoid virtuoso, but whatever. That's my main drop for that the guy out there. If you like it, check it out. Awesome. But yeah, flanger. I'm gonna be a jerk. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> gonna be. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. I've been called voice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> by your mother <laughs> yeah. um, I think all of that stuff I mean I, I, I dig the way I'd, I'd used uh, phasing on the you know on the first record but I think all of that stuff like Brian Eno called uh, what did he call he called uh, delay I think as the opiate for musicians, you know, like, like that, you know, it was a certain way to get a, to get a sound. No, I think all of that is bad. I think the flanging, the phasing, the chorusing is not good. I, th I think like, if you want to trace like where Ed sound went like a little bit sideways is when he got like a little too chorus happy. It, it feels like of a certain time in a certain place. You know, it's like those big wet drums that you hear. Sure. In the 80s, you know, yeah. in the 80s. Yeah. You know, as soon as you hear a chorus, you're like, okay, what year am I in? You know, <clears throat> I think um, I, th I think that uh, it's, it's good in small doses, but uh, 
I think that when Ed was at his worst was when he would dump in all that chorus all over his sound. I don't think he needed it. I, yeah, I, I, I think we, the chorus is the worst of the three in specific to him, but a phaser, I mean, come on, a phaser. It's yeah. Like, phaser that just makes so much of its personality ooh. on eruption and, yeah. uh, yeah, and, uh, atomic <laughs> punk and, yeah. you know, yeah, no, no, that was that... on unchained, you know, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Ed could do it. Yeah. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I'll tell you though, it's funny, like, cause I lived through it. Like when, when the phaser came first came in, I think in the sort of probably mid seventies, Chris would probably know a little bit year. earlier. Yeah. Early, early seventies, yeah, early seventies. Well, actually can go actually to the Univibe in the late sixties even. So, well, the Univibe I love actually, yeah. that that's my answer. Univibe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Robin Trower, Jimi Hendrix all day long. Um, but, uh, people really got crazy with the phase shifter in the, in like the mid seventies. And I can remember listening to a, the follow up to Edgar winners. They only come out at night, a, a record called shock treatment. And yeah. it had uh, Rick Derringer playing and they only come out at night by Edgar winner is one of the greatest sounding record engineered sounding records of all time. It just, it just is. It's just an incredible sounding record. And then shock treatment came out the follow up and I was so excited. And I think Rick Derringer is using like 10 million phase shifters all <laughs> over that record. And it, it, it almost made me vomit, you know, it's like, the <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm like enough. I think that that record killed it for me somehow. I get it. I get it. Yeah. That, think, that was going down the rabbit hole like a gigantic rabbit. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> That's where I want to go, man. You know, these, these questions, it's so hard because I I've I've asked those same questions to Steve Vai, Richard Fortis, like some of my absolute heroes. And and the answer is everyone is so passionate about them. And I love that because as guitarists, I think like I don't mean to minimize other instruments because I think they're all part of the same family, but Guitar players like they give a shit about their gear, you know, and they they, if they feel strongly about stuff. So I get it. That's the answers I want. So thank yeah. you. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for letting me have a look at this book uh, before anyone else got to you. It, it was uh, seriously really, really well done. I implore everyone to check it out on October 5th. There's yes. an Amazon link. You'll be able to find eruptions, conversations with Eddie Van Halen. Thank you guys so much for your time. Seriously, this has been really cool. Thank you, Rob. Hey, this has been a pleasure. Yeah, Rob. Great questions. A lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, cool. I look forward to this. And then, hey, maybe got something else cool down the road. Check that one out too, hopefully, because I like the I like the the Jimmy Page concept. So please do more things like this because this is really a cool way to look under the hood. So thank you guys. Good luck on the release. I'm sure it's going to kill. Stay safe and hope to see you soon. All right. Thanks. Same I got, thanks.